All right, so we're going to continue with the uh, diseases of the cardiovascular system and wrap it up with the diseases of the lymphatic system. Let's start off with an NCLEX prep practice question. After returning from international travel, a four-year-old female is diagnosed with falciparum malaria. All of the following complications may be associated with this disease, except which one of these? Splenic rupture, acute kidney injury, altered mental status, uh, peptic ulcer, and anemia. Well, hopefully you chose peptic ulcer because that's not going to have anything to do with malaria, right? It's going to have things related to the kidneys, uh, related to, of course, the spleen, and then the uh, things related to blood. So endocarditis is inflammation of the endocardium. This is the inner lining of the heart. Uh, this is most often referring to an infection of the valves of the heart, uh, particularly the mitral valve or the aortic valve. Um, and so this can be caused by Staphylococcus aureus, Streptococcus pneumoniae, or Streptococcus uh, pyogenes, uh, and also Neisseria gonorrhea. And so when you're doing the review on this unit, you can kind of approach that study guide um, either from a disease standpoint or from a microbe standpoint. Um, and some of them I did one way and the, some the other. Really, whatever works best for you is fine. However, it's going to help you learn the material, whichever organization way you prefer, that's fine with me, okay? Um, as long as you get the information and put it down on your study guide somewhere. That, that's my concern, all right? So um, we have two variations of endocarditis. We can have acute or subacute. Um, a lot of times when they are putting in surgically a prosthetic valve, um, the bacteria are going to be introduced during that procedure. And so that is a new hazard basically for developing um, endocarditis. Um, because the bacteria will, those valves will serve as a site of infection and then we're introducing it, of course, more bypassing our line of defense, being our skin and tissues, that first line. Um, <clears throat> so the symptoms are going to be similar for both acute and subacute. Um, you're going to see a little bit um, slower development of uh, endocarditis symptoms with subacute, with the subacute form, okay? And they're not going to be quite as pronounced or not as bad. Uh, so you'll see some fever, uh, fatigue, joint pain, edema in the feet, abdomen, or legs, some weakness, um, anemia, of course, an abnormal heartbeat. Um, sometimes the symptoms are kind of similar to a myocardial infarction. Uh, you can sometimes have abdominal or pain in the side. The patient is generally going to look very ill. You're going to see the petechiae, those ruptured uh, capillaries um, over the upper half of the body underneath the fingernails. Um, you can have what's called a Janeway lesion, which is a painless reddened skin spot on the palms of the hand and the soles of the feet. They can have Osler's nodes, which is a painful nodule on the pads of your fingers and toes. Um, subacute, you may, if you have it for a long time, you may have a large spleen occur. Um, and if they go on for a really lengthy amount of time, it can lead to having clubbed fingers and toes because there's no oxygen getting there. So acute uh, endocarditis usually occurs because you have an overwhelming presence of bacteria in the bloodstream. Um, certain bacteria can colonize the normal the heart valves normally. Um, you can have what we call vegetations or an accumulation of bacteria on the valves and then that will hamper their function. Okay, um, So that can lead directly to uh, death because you're having cardiac malfunction. Um, also pieces of the that vegetation, pieces of that clumped pieces of the clumped bacteria can break off and create an embolism or block vital organs. Okay, so that's very dangerous. Um, bacterial colonies um, are going to be a source of bloodborne bacteria, and so they can break off and invade the blood. Um, this is usually going to be caused by Staphylococcus aureus, but you could also see uh, Streptococcus pyogenes, pneumonia, Neisseria gonorrhea, and, and other bacteria as well. Um, so this is a parenteral route, so direct entry into the body, whether um, IV or via surgery. Um, you're going to see IV drug users and subcutaneous drug users are going to have a higher risk for this. Um, traumatic injuries and surgical procedures, which I already said, can also introduce a large number of bacteria 
uh, treatment is going to be gentamicin along with vancomycin. Um, and you're going to see this three times more often in males than females. So subacute endocarditis is generally going to follow damage to the heart valves or some congenital malformation. Uh, you can have irregularities in the valve that can encourage the attachment of bacteria, so physical differences in the valves. Um, <clears throat> bacteria and then will form biofilms, and so you'll have that conglomeration of bacteria, make it more difficult to treat, but also can in impede the normal function of the valve because there's physically a mass on the valve. Um, and so this can provide that ongoing source of bacteria in the bloodstream. Uh, people that have suffered rheumatic fever uh, can have damage to the heart valves, and so they are more susceptible to this condition. Um, this is usually caused by bacteria that aren't very pathogenic, um, and it can often start in the mouth or the oral cavity, all right? And so we have alpha hemolytic streptococci, uh, like streptococcus uh, sanguis, streptococcus oralis, or streptococcus mutans. All right, and so those are going to be some uh, hemolytic varieties that will rupture red blood cells. Um, normal biota from the skin and other bacteria can also uh, colonize abnormal valves and lead to a subacute endocarditis. So you can have a small cut in the skin or mucous membranes where the bacteria can enter. That way they get into the bloodstream and then that can lead to uh, colonization. Um, you can also, things like rigorous toothbrushing. So if you're breaking those colonies loose, okay, dental procedures, minor cuts or lacerations, all right. Uh, bacteria are generally not transmitted from other people to the environment. It's what's already there. And so they're getting it in uh, an opportuni opportunistic type infection. Uh, let's see. So the way to prevent this is, one, if you're going to have uh, some uh, surgical or dental procedures done, that on somebody that has an underlying heart irregularity, they're going to give antibiotics prophylactically or in, ahead of time. So that's why you'll often see some of these questionnaires in these different settings. They're very important. So septicemia, remember, is when microorganisms are multiplying in the blood. They're not just there, they're multiplying in the blood. Um, and so you're going to have fever, altered mental status, uh, chills, uh, GI symptoms. You're going to have increased breathing rate, which can also cause a respiratory alkalosis. Okay. Um, the biggest factor, the biggest uh, sign, I guess you would say, a symptom is going to be low blood pressure. Okay. That's kind of the hallmark, so to speak, of the condition. Um, that's going to be caused by the inflammatory response to infectious agents in the bloodstream, which is going to lead to a loss of fluids in vascular, which is going to cause a drop in blood pressure. This is going to be most the most dangerous feature because if you're if you get your blood pressure too low, you go into shock and you can die. All right. Um, the vast majority of these are going to, septicemia is going to be caused by bacteria, um, and that's going to kind of evenly be divided between gram positive and gram negative. MRSA is a very common one, methicillin uh, resistant Staphylococcus aureus. About 10% are fungal in nature. Uh, we do have polymicrobial infections where there can be more than one. Um, that's being identified more and more often. Gram-negative uh, bacteria multiplying in the bloodstream will release a large amount of endotoxin. That's going to cause a very large inflammatory response with a lot of uh, uh, cytokines being involved, which will will kind of reinforce that drop in blood pressure, and that is what we call endotoxic or gram-negative shock, okay, which is one of the reasons why it's so important to identify these species. Gram-positive bacteria can cause a similar cascade of events when fragments of their cell wall are released into the blood. Um, so these are often traced back to parenteral um, introduction of the microorganisms by an IV or a surgical procedure. Um, also, serious UTIs, uh, renal infections, prostatic, pancreatic, or even gallbladder issues, uh, infections. So parents that, uh, patients, not parents, <laughs> patients with underlying spleen uh, malfunctions may also be predisposed to having this, all right? Um, you can have meningitis, osteomyelitis, and you can also all uh, lead into a sepsis state, okay? So we've had about 200,000 cases per year in the U.S. 
Um, and those result in about 100,000 deaths. So that's a high mortality rate, okay? So with the bacteria being in the bloodstream, you're going to do a blood culture usually to diagnose this. Uh, there are some sequencing techniques that can be used for quicker and more appropriate um, targeted treatment. Um, And so once they know which organism is there, we can we can adjust the treatment um, according to the bacteria and their susceptibilities. All right, next we have bubonic plague. This is going to be caused by Yersinia pestis. I think the name is probably on the next slide. Um, and you'll see things like um, enlarged lymph nodes, fever, headaches, nausea, weakness, uh, leading to aseptasemia. Um, this is going to be a gram negative rod. Um, and it is actually, we were taught that the plague was caused by rats, but it was actually carried by the fleas on the rats. Um, it does have a, a capsule. Um, we have had pandemics of the Black Plague or Bubonic Plague uh, probably since the beginning of time, they estimate, um, very, very early on um, it, that is recorded. So you have three types here. You can have the pneumonic plague, which is a respiratory disease that we'll look at in Chapter 19, bubonic plague, and septicemic plague. Okay, so those are the three types of uh, plague that we can have. Bacteria can be uh, injected into the skin by the bite of the flea. It will then go to the lymph node and then is filtered uh, by that lymph node. And then an infection will cause inflammation and necrosis of the node and cause a swollen uh, lymph node, which we call a bubo. And that's usually in the groin area or the axilla area. Okay, it's got an incubation period of about two to eight days where you will end up with fever, uh, headache and chills some nausea, weakness, and, and perhaps tenderness, of course, at the site of the bubo. Um, this has got a mortality rate of about 15%, even with proper treatment. Um, these often will progress to uh, a septicemia, a bacterial growth in the blood. Um, and that's going to result in DIC, which I think I mentioned once before, which is disseminated intravascular coagulation. OK, um, and that's basically where you're throwing blood clots all over your body. So it's a very, very dire condition. Um, it can also cause subcutaneous hemorrhage, which can then degenerate into ne necrosis and gangrene, which is what we see here um, in the picture at right. So this is Arsenia pestis here, the little uh, purple things there. Uh, you can see it is a gram negative rod. This is a mem family member of uh, Enterobacteria. Um, and it's going to have a very unusual uh, staining that makes it look kind of like a safety pin. Um, and so there is, uh, you can see it here in this picture, it looks a little bit like a safety pin. Um, so the number of bacteria that is needed to start plague is very, very small. You only need uh, maximum of like three. Three to 50 of these cells can make you sick. That's a very, very low. Um, again, fleas are the principal agent of transmission. The flea is going to get a bud, uh, blood meal from an infected uh, animal. Bacteria multiply in its gut. Then it's going to um, not be able to feed. It's going to jump because it's going to be blocked. It's going to jump from animal to animal to get nourishment. And during this process, it's going to regurgitate some of that infectious material. That material is kind of clogged in its uh, throat here. Um, so the treatment is going to be streptomycin or gentamicin. Um, plague has been found all over the world. Um, in the developing world, we have cut this way back, uh, but it is actually increasing in Africa and some other areas of the world. So tularemia is a zoonotic infection associated with rabbits. Uh, it is Fran Francescella tularenesis, which is the name of the um, microbe here. It's going to have an incubation period of a few days to a few weeks. Uh, you're going to have headache, backache, fever, coughing, weakness, chills, swollen lymph nodes, um, even ulcerative lesions, conjunctivitis, and it can even lead to pneumonia. Um, the mammals are the chief reservoir. It's also called rabbit fever um, and it is endemic to the northern hemisphere. Oh, let's see. So um, this is often picked up when people are skinning 
diseased rabbits. Um, the death rate of the most serious form is going to be up to 30%, which is one out of three. It's pretty high. Um, but if you treat with gentamicin or streptomycin, it's going to reduce the mortality rate to almost zero. So that's, that's very big. Okay. This is going to be a gram negative bacterium. It is a facultative intracellular uh, bacteria. Okay. Uh, let's see. We said this is also sometimes called rabbit fever. This is listed as a category A bioterrorism agent along with anthrax, plague, and others. So it's on, on a list of things to be very carefully watched for. Rabbits and, and other rodents are going to be the chief reservoirs. Uh, skunk, beaver, fox, possum, domestic animals also. Um, with the decline of rabbit hunting, we have seen an increase in the number of tick bites being more common because they there being um, an arthropod vector there, followed by biting flies, mites, and mosquitoes after that. All right, so let's see. The infection dose here, infective dose here is 10 to 50 organisms, so still not very many. All right, this particular uh, bacterium is considered one of the most infectious of all bacteria. Okay, we have seen tularemia appear in people who have accidentally run over dead rabbits while mowing the lawn. That's crazy, okay? So they are assuming that it was aerosolized bacteria and they inhaled them, okay? Um, so let's see. Um, you can, can have relapses with this. Um, you're going to, of course, want to put on uh, antibiotics, but you cannot stop them early, all right? Usually you're going to use a doxycycline or ciprofloxacin. Um, to help prevent the disease. And then if you are dealing with contaminated uh, mammal, you want to wear gloves, mask, and eyewear as well. All right, so next we have Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the cause of Lyme's disease, all right? Um, this is going to uh, be a gram-negative bacterium. Um, these are spirochetes, you can see here in the picture. Um, they're gonna have, uh, you know, some spaced out coils there. Um, the bacterium is a master of evading the immune system, okay? It's going to display antigenic shift. It's going to change its antigens um, while it's in the tick. It's going to kind of mutate a little bit. And then again, after it's been transmitted to the human host, it can mutate even more. Uh, it does uh, initiate a strong uh, cellular and humoral immune response. Um, but it's mainly that response, even though it is, is a good, healthy response, it is very ineffective because of the antigenic shift, because the bacterium can swap its antigens, and so it's not going to recognize it. Um, and that may contribute to the pathogenicity or pathology of the infection. Uh, this is generally going to be transmitted by the uh, Ixodes scapularis tick, a hard tick, which also the uh, black-legged deer tick um, in the northeast. Um, it's going to have a very complex life cycle that lasts about two years with two principal hosts. Um, the reservoir is going to be the dusky-footed wood rat in some areas. Um, we have clusters of Lyme disease hotspots, particularly up in the northeast in the U.S. Um, and those are going to occur where you have large populations of both the intermediate host and the definitive host, all right? So if you're going to be outside, and especially in these areas, you should wear protective clothing, use insect repellent, those types of things, okay? Check for ticks regularly. Um, remove ticks without uh, crushing them. Using You want to use forceps and gloves so that you don't leave the head in there, okay? And so that you don't get an infection, all right? Um, if it is diagnosed... I'm sorry, if it is longer than two weeks, um, you want to um, treat with doxycycline and amoxicillin. You'll see with ticks, you're often going to use doxycycline. Um, also use penicillin later on in, in later disease processes. So in this picture down here at the bottom, you see a case of disseminated limes where you see several rashes, not just one at the side of, a, of the tick bite. And that's a common misconception. Um, early symptoms, you're going to see fever, headaches, stiff neck, dizziness. Uh, and then if you do not treat it and you do not catch it, it is going to move on to the second stage. Um, and it can even uh, go on to a third stage. The second stage, you're going to have cardiac and neurologic symptoms. 
uh, even a facial palsy. Um, you can have in the third stage, you can have arthritis uh, or chronic neurologic complications that are very um, disabling. And there's, there's actually a lot of argument among some of the doctors on treatment of this. Um, my sister lives in the hot zone and everybody in her, in her house has had it, some of them two or three times. And so they've gone on long-term uh, IV antibiotics. And there are just some general differences in how some of them are treating. And hopefully that's changing. So treatment doxycycline, amoxicillin, cephalosporin, penicillin. Okay, so mononucleosis or the kissing disease. This is a lymphatic system disease. We're in the lymphatic system now. Um, this is also sometimes just called mono. Uh, this is, you're going to see a sore throat, fever. You're going to have uh, some cervical lymphadenopathy, uh, enlarged spleen. This can be caused by a number of bacteria or viruses, but the largest portion of them are actually caused by the Epstein-Barr virus, which is a member of the herpes virus family. This has a 30 to 50 day incubation period. Then you'll see the sore throat, high fever, uh, swollen lymph nodes, uh, gray white um, exudate in the throat, skin rash. Um, one of the uh, biggest signs is seen in sudden what we call leukocytosis, which is an, an initially of infected B cells and then later on T cells. And fatigue, that's the hallmark of the disease, is that, is that long-term fatigue, okay? Um, the cell-mediated response is, is uh, really important for controlling the disease. About 90% of the world's population has been infected with Epstein-Barr virus. Um, and so in general, the virus does not cause any noticeable symptoms. And it's really the time that you first encounter the virus that it really seems to matter if you're going to have uh, symptoms. If you're infected during the teen years, you're going to get the disease about a quarter of the time, 25% of the time. Before or after that period, you're usually asymptomatic, okay? Why that is, I don't have the full understanding of that. I'm sure we're still learning about that as well. Um, direct and oral contact uh, and contamination with saliva, uh, you know, drinking after someone is a big way that it happens in high schools. Um, and so you're going to treat with palliative care, so treat the symptoms, okay? Um, the, the main thing you have to look for is a rupture of a spleen, and if that is to occur, you're going to have to have surgery immediately. So many of the agents um, that are going to infect the cardiovascular system, the blood and the lymphatic system will cause very high fevers. Uh, and some of these are gonna be in, accompanied by internal hemorrhaging. So we're gonna look at hemorrhagic uh, fever diseases and then we'll look at non-hemorrhagic fever uh, diseases. Um, so having the virus in the bloodstream causes the capillaries to become more frail. Um, and it actually can interrupt our ability to clot blood and that can lead to varying degrees of pathology and up to death. All of the viruses causing hemorrhagic fever are going to be RNA enveloped viruses. Um, distribution of these viruses are going to be limited to the natural host distribution, so wherever the host is. Um, so we have, uh, let's see, Ebola had a big outbreak in uh, 2014 in Africa. That one tends to come and uh, resurge, and then it'll hide for a while and resurge. 2014 was the biggest outbreak of Ebola. That's one of the worst hemorrhagic fevers. Um, we also have uh, chikungunya, which is the d disease that causes yellow fever and dengue fever. Those are going to be spread by mosquitoes. Um, Anyway, we'll look at all these as we're going forward. All right, so these are caused by the, these are in the class of filoviruses, and these are going to act by disrupting clotting factors. So it's going to prevent clotting. Then they're going to be transmitted by contact of bodily fluids, and there is no known treatment at this time. Um, and so their virulence factor is that disruption of the blood clotting system, which can cause bleeding and shock. So we've got yellow fever. Uh, the mosquito, uh, Aedes mosquito, is the vector. It is found in Africa and South America. Uh, it's going to be more frequent in a rainy climate, and this is going to be accompanied by jaundice, hence the word yellow. Uh, then we have chikungunya. This is going to be uh, endemic to Africa, um, and it 
appeared in Central America 2013, Europe 2014, went from zero to 1.7 million cases in three years. All right. This is also spread uh, by the uh, Aedes mosquito as the vector. Um, this one you're going to see arthritic symptoms. Then we have dengue fever, which is Southwest Asia and Africa. Uh, do have some in South America or Central America and the Caribbean. Aedes mosquitoes, again, used to be called or sometimes called the break bone fever because it causes such severe pain. And then we have Ebola and Marburg, which are two of the really nasty ones. The vector again, um, well, let me back up a second. So uh, Ebola and Marburg, these are going to be endemic to uh, Africa. Um, you're going to see extreme fragility of the capillaries, and patients will bleed from basically every orifice and mucous membrane in their body. This one is very, very bad. Um, they believe that bats are the natural reservoir of Ebola. These spread with direct contact with bodily fluids. You will have that massive hemorrhaging all over the body, occasionally a rash. Um, Lassa fever is endemic to West Africa. 80% uh, of the cases here are uh, asymptomatic, okay? The other are going to have very severe symptoms develop. Um, the, the rat is going to be the reservoir. Rodents, at the rodents, uh, this is going to be spread via droplet transmission and direct contact with fluids. Um, if you're interested in these, you might watch uh, The Hot Zone or read the book The Hot Zone. Uh, you can learn a lot about Ebola and about the... Um, different little levels of containing the labs, the biosafety level uh, for labs, that type of thing. Really very interesting. So the non-hemorrhagic fever diseases um, are infectious diseases that result in a syndrome that's going to have high fever, but not having the capillary fragility that causes the hemorrhaging, okay? And so they can be caused by brucellosis, Q fever, cat scratch disease. We'll look at ehrlichiosis, anaplasmosis, and Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Um, and so Babi Babiosis uh, is going to cause uh, brucellosis. This is also called Malta fever, undulant fever. Um, this can cause a large outbreak of uh, placental infections and uh, loss of livestock. Okay, um, this is also listed as a possible uh, bioterrorism agent. Um, this is going to be gram negative. These can actually survive in the phagocytic cells, and then those will carry the bacteria on through the bloodstream. You're going to see some lesions in the liver, the spleen, bone marrow, or kidney. Um, if it's in a human being, what you're going to see uh, as kind of an identifying um, mark here is going to be that undulating uh, or fluctuating pattern of fever. Okay, so an undulant fever is going to go up and down, up and down, up and down. All right, so uh, brucella is a tiny aerobic gram-negative cocobacilli, and we have several uh, species. We have uh, melantensis, uh, brucella abortus, brucella suis. Uh, so suis pig abortus means abortion, so a spontaneous abortion, which means loss of the uh, animal or child. Um, usually you're going to have infection of the placenta and the uh, fetus, okay? Human placentas do not necessarily become infected, uh, but they may have uh, a spontaneous abortion, which means a miscarriage or stillbirth. All right, so this is going to enter through the skin or mucous membranes of the digestive tract, conjunctiva, or the respiratory tract, and there those phagocytic cells are going to take it in, and they are able to avoid uh, our defenses from the phagocytes. They cannot be phagocytized, so they'll be transported through the bloodstream right to where they need to go, unfortunately, okay, and onto the other organs. Um, so the up and down fever, the nature of that fever is related to the lipopolysaccharide um, in the uh, bacterium. This is going to be spread by direct con contact, parenteral, so needle stick, uh, or even airborne. Treatment is going to be doxycycline, gentamicin, or streptomycin. Next, they're going to have Q fe uh, fever, which stands for query, and that's because they were not able to identify the cause of it. Um, and so the signs and symptoms here are going to be abrupt onset of fever, um, headache, chills, muscle aches, uh, occasionally you'll have a rash. Um, this is sometimes complicated by pneumonia in about one-third of cases, or hepatitis and endocarditis, 
one quarter of these will become chronic instead of acute. Uh, and so you can have some damage to the vascular system. And so you can have some endocarditis like type symptoms. Um, below that we have Coxellia bernetti. This is a very small pleomorphic. So that means variable shape. It can change shape or come in different shapes. Uh, gram negative bacteria. Um, this is going to be harbored by arthropods, okay, um, and vertebrates, um, particularly ticks, okay. So those are really essential for the transmission between uh, wild and domestic animals. Um, now, ticks do not transmit this disease to humans. Humans only get the infection because of contam uh, environmental contamination, airborne um, products like placentas of domestic animals um, that have a large number of bacteria. Okay, so people at high risk for this are going to be farm workers, uh, veterinarians, people cutting meat, those types of things. Um, even milk, people doing uh, dealing with uh, raw milk. Um, so airborne direct contact or foodborne transmission. This does have an endospore-like structure associated with it, and treatment is going to be with doxycycline. Remember, ticks think doxycycline. Next, we have Bartonella hensley, which is also known as cat scratch disease. Uh, this is a gram negative bacteria. It does have an endotoxin. It is on the small side. You can see uh, the swollen lymph nodes here in the uh, axilla area. It is fastidious, but it is not an oblig obligate intracellular parasite, so we can grow this on blood agar. Uh, this is going to be transmitted primarily uh, from cats and fleas, okay? Um, fleas to the cats, I should say. This is actually going to be present in 40% of cats, particularly kittens. So there are 25,000 cases per year here in the U.S. 80% of those are going to be children 2 to 14 years of age. Um, you're going to see signs or symptoms of this one to two weeks after being clawed or bitten by a cat. And you'll have some small papules at the site of uh, infection there or inoculation. Um, most infections are going to stay localized and resolve on their own within a few weeks. Um, you can treat with azithromycin, erythromycin, or rifampin, um, but you can also control, uh, prevent this by controlling fleas um, and using and cleaning the wound of a cat bite with antiseptics, cleaning them very well. Ehrlichiosis is caused by Ehrlichia species. This is gram negative, also spread via the uh, Exodes tick. Uh, small intracellular bacterium with a very strict parasitic existence, okay, in, in association with those ticks. You're going to have acute fever resulting with headache, muscle pain. Um, patients will recover with no lasting effects, but about 5%. Uh, of those vulnerable population, the older or chronically ill patients can actually die from this. Um, you could diagnose this with a PCR test and uh, antibody test. It can be hard to differentiate this between uh, uh, Lyme's disease and Borrelia, um, and sometimes those are co-infections. So treatment, what do you do to treat with ticks with? Doxycycline, right? That will clear up most infections within about a week. Next we have anaplasma. This is going to cause anaplasmosis. This is an intracellular gram negative bacteria. Uh, it has similar characteristics of Ehrlichia and it causes almost the same clinical man manifestations. But these are going to be found in different geographic locations and so they're carried by two different types of ticks. And so you're generally going to see one or the other. Okay. Um, and you're going to treat this with, you guessed it, doxycycline. Next, we're going to have babesiosis, which is a protozoan now that is going to affect red blood cells. Uh, and I forgot to point that out in the other uh, picture. The, the little dots are the bacterium in the red blood cells. Well, this is, an, this is going to be a protozoa in the red blood cells. It has similar symptoms as Ehrlichia and anaplasma. It is also going to be carried by ticks. This is going to be found in the northeastern United States and Great, Great Lakes region. You're going to diagnose this by looking at a blood, blood smear. And so you should be able to see the protozoa inside the red blood cells. Um, you can use a combined um, antimicrobial therapy of, uh, well, antiprotozoal, I should say, of uh, 
adovaquan, which is going to be antiprotozoal, plus uh, zerithromycin or clindamycin and quinine. Okay, so you're going to see a combination of antibiotics and antiprotozoan. Okay. Uh, please take note, this is mislabeled in the chart. It says bacteria and this is protozoa. Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. This is one that we do see in our area. We do see some Lyme's disease, but not much. Uh, fever, headache, and rash. Uh, Rickettsia rickettsi is the one responsible. Okay, that's going to be transmitted by ticks. All right, so this is going to be southeast and eastern seaboard, but we do fall in that range. Um, does happen in Canada, South America, Central America. Uh, these infections are going to show up in the spring and summer when ticks are going to be active. They're the vector. Um, and that's going to change with the weather, okay? Rickettsia rickettsi, transmitted by the wood tick, lone star tick, American dog tick. Um, two to four days after it incubates, it has an incubation period two to four days, you're going to see those fever and chills, headache, muscle pain, and then a very distinctive spotted rash, okay, that's going to occur. Uh, usually it's going to occur on the wrist first, then the forearms and ankles, and then spread. Early lesions look a little bit like measles, but then they can change shape to look like other rashes, okay? If it's untreated and severe, you can have enlarged lesions that can become necrotic. Um, and then you can also be predisposed to gangrene in your toes and fingertips if you ignore it. Um, and if it's really bad, you can have uh, issues with your cardiovascular system, hypotension, thrombosis, and hemorrhaging. Uh, you can also see some delirium convulsions, um, coma, um, when it has taken over the nervous sense, the central nervous system. And about 20% of untreated cases can actually die, uh, and that's lower to 5 to 10% with treated cases. So we have Chagas disease, sometimes called the uh, American trypanosoma psychosis. Um, this is going to be a very long incubation period, and it is very hard to get rid of. And this is going to be caused by trypanosoma cruzi. This is a flagellated protozoan that you can see here at left. Um, trypanosoma uh, Brucei uh, is going to be what causes uh, sleeping sickness in the African continent. So it is related, but it's different, okay? Um, and so these are going to actually multiply in the blood and blood cells, and then those are going to rupture, and the trypanosomes are going to be released into the bloodstream. Um, during the acute phase, you're going to see a mild to severe fever, nausea, and fatigue. Um, and you're going to get what's called a shagoma up here at the site of the bite. Um, if it's close to the eyes, you can actually get swelling of the eyelids and things. Um, during the chronic phase, uh, you're usually going to be asymptomatic. Um, and those trypanosomes are going to actually travel throughout the body and can even interrupt the function of the heart, the brain, and the intestinal tract. Next, we have Chagas disease, and this is going to be uh, spread by the kissing bug, uh, which is tri triatomenes. Um, and so these can be transmitted vertically. It will cross the placenta. Um, it can also be transmitted via blood transfusion. Um, people are usually going to pick this up if they travel outside of the U.S. Uh, we do screen all donated blood for this particular disease. There is no vaccine uh, for Chagas disease. Um, pesticides are helpful to, to keep uh, the tri, tri, um, the kissing bugs, it's a little easier to say, keep the, the, the bugs at bay, okay? Um, but the treatment is going to work the best if you are uh, able to uh, do that in the acute phase, okay? Uh, in the chronic phase, um, you're usually going to have treatment just for things like cardiac issues uh, and other problems. All right, so next we're going to have anthrax. This is, an, uh, this is our last one, I believe. It is a zoonotic disease. It's an infection um, that can exhibit its primary symptoms in different areas of the body. And so we have three forms, basically. We have uh, cutaneous, pulmonary, and ingested forms, okay? Um, and so the skin would be cutaneous, and the lungs is going to be pulmonary anthrax. So cutaneous anthrax, pulmonary an anthrax, and then in the GI tract. Uh, which can be by eating ingested meat, okay? And this is going to uh, also sometimes cause anthrax meningitis, so it can infect the central nervous system. 
The cutaneous and the pulmonary forms of the disease are the ones that are the most common. Um, usually the anthrax bacterium, uh, Bacillus anthracis, will get access to the bloodstream. Um, and it can cause an overwhelming septicemia, which can result in death. This is going to be transmitted via contact, inhalation, or ingestion. Um, so, sorry, I have to stop and think of where I was going with this. Septicemic anthrax is possible with any of the forms of anthrax, okay? Um, so we've known about this for many centuries because it is such a, a zoonotic disease and it tends to strike herbivores. Um, it's been very important in the history of medical microbiology. Koch used anthrax as a model for developing his postulates. Pasteur used this to prove the usefulness of vaccination. Um, let's see. I think that is everything on this slide. All right, so here you can see anthrax at right. Bacillus anthracis is gram positive. It does have endospores. You can see those there. It is the largest of all bacterial pathogens. It's kind of uh, block or rectangle shaped, um, pretty wide. It's, it's got that central endospore that helps it um, develop in all growth conditions except for living in the body of the host. It uh, is usually found in the soil, okay? Um, and so these are going to be, these endospores are going to be dispersed in dust, water, onto the bodies of plants and, an, 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 <laughs> animals. <laughs> so pulmonary anthrax and pulmonary edema and hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic lung symptoms sometimes are what can actually cause you to die from this. Um, and it's difficult to separate the effects of the septicemia from the effects of the pulmonary infection, okay? Um, at the site of infection, um, you're going to see some symptoms, um, but then you can have the septicemic version. You can get headache, fever, and malaise. Bleeding in the intestines or mucous membranes um, can occur during the late stages of these. So we did have an attack of anthrax through the mail in 20, or 2001. Um, this was aimed at senators, and I think I talked about this a little bit. 22 people obtained uh, acquired anthrax. Five people died. Um, I think I already said this, but we even had some people here in New Boston that were mailing this. It was very scary. Um, and so this is going to have a polypeptide or several protein capsule. Um, it's going to have the tripartite toxin and that is a protein composed of three separate exotoxins okay so that's going to cause massive inflammation and uh, shock basically um, some people have a gene that actually codes for a surface protein that makes it harder for the bacterium's toxin to enter the cell so that's that's a good way to uh, come up with maybe a treatment strategy um, it also has hemolysins um, and other enzymes that damage host membranes. It is a facultative parasite, um, and it, it undergoes part of its life cycle and vegetation growth and sporulation while it is in the soil. All right, And then animals become infected with it when they are grazing on grass that's contaminated with those endospores. And then that pathogen will be returned to the soil um, when that particular atom goes to the the bathroom excrement or if they die by their carcass okay and then it will sporulate um, and then that will be a long-term reservoir of infection okay so uh, we've got a lot of natural anthrax, anthrax cases in livestock from Africa Asia and the Middle East as well uh, and so there's going to be a really high level of suspicion to diagnose anthrax um, this is a very rare disease and it can mimic many other diseases that are not so rare. So you want to look for those first. Um, if you think this is what you're dealing with, what they're going to do is culture the bacterium on blood agar, perform a gram stain. Um, then, of course, if it is confirmed, uh, suspected, you want to send it to the CDC to be confirmed. Uh, there they can do antibody testing. You can do phage testing. Uh, there is a purified toxoid form that humans can be vaccinated with if they are in a uh, contact with livestock or products from livestock, um, members of the military. Uh, there is a vaccine. you got to get five shots over a year uh, and an annual booster. Okay, so it's a more cumbersome uh, vaccination. 
So people being uh, suspected of being exposed to the bacterium are going to be given prophylactic antibiotics, which seems to be pretty effective at actually preventing the disease. Uh, and these are going to include doxycycline, uh, ciprofloxacin, um, although some antibiotic treatment can sometimes worsen symptoms. And if you are treating a human case, uh, you need to be consulting with the CDC.